Meet Elliot, a successful, intelligent man with a normal life. That is, until the day he underwent brain surgery to remove a tumor. Don't get me wrong, the procedure was technically a success. His memory was left intact, his IQ as high as ever. He could analyze problems, list solutions, and even debate philosophy. But then, something strange happened. He could not make even the simplest decision. What to eat for lunch? Hours of deliberation. What color pen to use? An impossible dilemma, so much so that he would much rather dedicate himself to mastering the intricate art of the tiny violin. But while this might sound amusing on the surface, in reality, Elliot's condition was deeply frustrating and debilitating. During the surgery, Elliot lost the part of his brain involved in emotional processing, and with that, his ability to make decisions. This raises an intriguing question. What role do emotions play in cognitive function? And can you think entirely without emotions, i.e. be 100% rational? It turns out this isn't just a philosophical thought experiment. It's a real scientific debate with implications for everything from AI to how we make decisions in daily life. So let's explore all that in today's video. We are used to being taught that being rational is about setting emotion aside. But where does this idea come from? And is there any real basis for it? Throughout history, several thinkers have either dismissed emotions as obstacles to reason or tried to minimize their influence on thinking. Most famous examples include Plato, who saw emotions as forces that, while powerful, needed to be guided by reason. In his tripartite model of the soul from the Republic, he divides human nature into three parts. First, reason or logos, which he regards as the highest faculty, associated with wisdom and philosophers. Then there is the spirit, themos, emotions like pride, anger, and courage, which can serve reason when properly aligned. And lastly, appetite, epithemia, base desires like hunger, lust, which must be controlled to avoid excess. He argued that the ideal person, especially the philosopher, should prioritize reason over emotions, which he saw as having a higher potential to be chaotic and misleading, if not utilized to serve a higher purpose. But Plato was not alone in his skepticism towards emotions. The Stoics, Zeno and Epictetus, took this idea even further. They argued that emotions are disturbances of the soul, Irrational responses that cloud judgment. According to Stoicism, the ideal person is one who achieves apathia, a state of inner tranquility where reason governs emotions rather than being controlled by them. The Stoics saw emotions like fear, anger, and desire as obstacles to wisdom and advocated for mastering them through rigorous self discipline and rational reflection. Centuries later, Rene Descartes reinforced the division between reason and emotion with his famous dictum, I think, therefore I am. Descartes saw emotions as bodily reactions, separate from pure intellect, that defines human experience. For example, joy might cause a warm, expansive sensation, while sadness feels like a grip on the heart. His dualism placed reason in the domain of the immaterial mind, while emotions arising from bodily mechanisms were seen as separate forces that needed to be understood and guided by reason. This idea influenced many Enlightenment thinkers who often prioritized rational thought as the foundation of progress and control. Even in modern times, thinkers like Ayn Rand and some logical positivists dismissed emotions as secondary to objective reason. Rand in particular saw emotions as mere byproducts of one's rational or irrational thoughts, arguing that morality should be grounded in logic alone, without interferences from feelings. These ideologies, even if unintentionally, position emotions as something bad and inferior to logic and reason. They seem to adorn emotions with such a bad connotation. 
There is this overarching belief that emotions are secondary, something to be controlled or even set aside. But can logic and reason actually exist without emotion? Because even the pursuit of an answer to a problem is driven by curiosity, frustration, satisfaction, all emotions. The very act of reasoning, supposedly a domain of the logical faculty, is emotionally driven. And this isn't just a philosophical paradox. Neuroscience confirms it. Because when the brain loses the ability to process emotions, it doesn't gain perfect rationality. It loses the ability to think effectively at all. Many years ago, neuroscientist Antonia Damasio was presented with a curious case. A patient, he referred to as Iliot, had led quite a successful and normal life. That is, up to the point of undergoing a surgery to remove a brain tumor. During the procedure, the part of his brain involved in emotional processing and decision-making, called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, was damaged. This left him completely unable to make even the simplest decisions, from what to wear to how to organize his work folders. This led Damasio to develop a hypothesis he termed the somatic marker hypothesis. The idea that emotions act as shortcuts or markers that help us navigate decision-making. Normally, when faced with a choice, we don't just analyze options logically. We feel an instinctive pull towards one or away from another. These emotional signals, shaped by past experiences and values and preferences, allow us to make efficient intuitive decisions. Without them, as Eliot's case showed, even the simplest choices become an endless loop of deliberation with no clear answer. Damasio found that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex serves as the bridge between rational thought and emotional intuition. It doesn't generate emotions, but it interprets emotional signals from deeper brain structures, like the amygdala, and applies them to decision-making. In Iliad's case, that bridge was severed. He could still reason flawlessly, but his decisions had no weight, no internal push towards one choice over another. Interestingly, a condition known as alexithymia, where individuals struggle to identify and describe their emotions, has also been linked to impaired decision-making. It is estimated to affect 10% of the population. Studies suggest that without a clear emotional response to guide choices, even everyday decisions can become overwhelming, mirroring what we saw in Iliad's case. The somatic marker hypothesis was faced with skepticism, given that it was based on one or two cases, and that it couldn't be ruled out completely that in the case of Eliot, his indecisiveness might have involved other cognitive factors like working memory deficits. But numerous other studies in psychology and neuroscience have continued to support the idea that emotions and reasoning are deeply intertwined. For example, research has shown that emotions play a crucial role in weighing options and making choices, particularly in situations involving uncertainty or personal significance. Not to mention that emotions are fundamental to motivation. They act like internal signals that guide behavior. Fear prompts avoidance, joy encourages repetition, and frustration drives problem solving. Far from being mere distractions, as was believed by many thinkers who place logic above all else, emotions shape the very process of how we think and make decisions. While we can analytically dissect problems, the very framework for analysis emerges from evolutionarily older emotional systems. But what do we actually mean by thinking logically? Well, logical thinking means following clear reasoning to analyze information, spot patterns, and make sound decisions. It's more about weighing evidence and staying consistent. But logic isn't emotionless. Emotions shape what we focus on, what problems we try to solve, and how we judge risk and reward. They guide the value system that we end up adopting. That being said, AI, at least in the current state, has no emotions. 
But does that mean that it can actually think? Well, AI doesn't reason in the way that humans do. It doesn't reflect or question. Instead, it identifies statistical patterns in vast amounts of data and applies probabilistic reasoning to make predictions or generate outputs. Its thought process is shaped entirely by the patterns it learns from training data, meaning it inherits not only the structure of logic, but also the biases embedded in that data. Biases that ultimately stem from human values and thought processes and emotions. Unlike humans who weigh decisions based on past experiences and ethical considerations, AI optimizes for the most probable outcome, not for understanding and meaning. Even in the most recent reasoning models, the AI is still limited by the knowledge and biases of its dataset. If the training data reflects flawed logic or gaps in human understanding, the model will struggle to reason beyond these constraints. It won't genuinely challenge its own conclusions unless explicitly programmed to do so. It does not know why one reasoning path is preferable over another beyond its statistical alignment with successful reasoning patterns from its training data. It has no stakes in the outcome of discussions. Humans, in contrast, develop reasoning from first-hand experience and emotional weighting of ideas. However, some researchers are exploring whether AI can be made to learn in a way that more closely mimics human experiences. One approach is incorporating pain and pleasure analogs, reward and punishment signals that could shape AI behavior much like humans and animals learn from conditioning. In theory, this would allow AI to learn from consequences the way that biological organisms do, reinforcing beneficial behaviors while discouraging undesirable ones. But if AI starts reacting to artificial pain and pleasure, does that bring it one step closer to true experience? If an AI can suffer from negative reinforcement, even in a purely simulated way, does that blur the line between artificial optimization and genuine sentience? And if AI ever reaches a point where its behavior mimics emotions so closely that we can no longer tell the difference, does it deserve ethical consideration? But thought itself and the process of thinking are largely influenced by language, and one could only wonder, does language limit or expand the way we think? If you are interested, I've explored this further in two videos that you might enjoy. You can check them out right here.